we're delighted now to uh, welcome to the programme uh, James Argent because after seven years of struggling, uh, James, uh, former Taui star, is talking about his battle with cocaine addiction. Now, this comes just after a few months uh, when he returned home from a rehab clinic in Thailand where he spent 10 weeks recovering from two near fatal overdoses. Yeah. It's so good to see you sitting there, James. Um, love to you from us, firstly, and we're so pleased to see you looking so well there at your, your home in Essex. I wish you were here with us. Um, why did you decide to, to go so public now and you want to talk about this? I kind of feel like... A, oh, good morning to the pair of you, by the way. I can't see... I can't see you, Ruth or Eamon, but Ruth, I'm sure you're looking as gorgeous well, as ever. I did my hair off, so, hair, yeah, so. it's fab. It's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hello? Yeah, we can yeah, hear we you. Yeah, we can hear you, mate. Oh. Can you, you hear me? You can hear me, yeah? Yes, yeah. Well, yes, loud and clear. OK, so um, I kind of feel like it was, like, the worst kind of kept secret over the last kind of few years. I mean, it was quite... Uh, apparent to everyone that I'd had various trips to rehab and stuff and I just kind of felt I never really wanted to come out and just kind of own it and, and kind of admit to my problems because I just kind of felt that A, people might judge me, people look down on me, you know, cast opinions of me and, and I suppose I kind of felt really, um, you know, ashamed and, and embarrassed. Um, but then I kind of feel that, you know, when I look at it, some of my heroes, you know, the likes of... Robbie Williams, you know, Davina McCall, Russell Brand, Ronnie Wood, Wood from Rolling Stones. Like, these are all people that I hugely respect and who I look up to and I'm fans of. And if they can kind of have similar stories to myself and similar problems and they've kind of owned it and moved forward and got themselves happy and, and healthy and achieved amazing things. And I kind of feel like, you know, that's what I want to do as well. And I think I was just, you know, so scared. And also I don't feel like I was necessarily ready those years ago because I was kind of still in denial, um, still thinking that I can, don't know, possibly control it or I could just, you know, get myself better. But um, I just feel like now I'm, you know, I'm in my 30s now and, um, you know, I've fully accepted that my life, you know, had become completely unmanageable, um, you know, A, with drugs and B, with, you know, my eating disorder. Well, we'll talk about that eating disorder and, and how the two are interrelated in just a moment. But I just want to say, Arge, we've seen quite a lot of you over the past couple of years. And you, you say, you know, a lot of people would have known about this. But this, this was news to Ruth and I because you're always the most affable, the most okay. friendly guy. You yeah. look... You, I mean, I think the last time I saw you, I was telling you how well you look. You were, you were looking really great. Are you telling me yeah. that underneath all of that, you were good in public, but not good in private. I mean, ever since I was a teenager, I'd always kind of put on a front. Like if um, I'd always laugh everything off, um, I'd always kind of be the entertainer, the joker, the performer, might try and make people laugh. And maybe that was a way of like, um, like hiding my, you know, insecurities and and my feelings. Always being the joker and, and kind of, you know mucking, you know, mucking about. And I kind of feel that from, you know, from a young age, um, from a young age, I've always kind of struggled uh, in terms of, like, body image, um, the way I've looked and uh, and things like that. And maybe I've used my kind of personality or, um, you know, when you see me time to time, being the smiley, happy... You know, I am that. I can be that and, and I want to be that again. But sometimes, a lot of the time, it could have been, you know, just for show to cover up. It was almost like wearing a mask, you know? And, James, when, when did you start taking cocaine? And I presume as starting off as, you know, recreationally. When did you realise that you had an addiction? Or did you listen to people when they were telling you they were worried you had an addiction? I mean, I, 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 I think I started going to nightclubs, obviously, from around the age of 18. And, and I remember... I mean, I've got many friendship groups and I'd, I'd hear of some of my friends trying drugs and, and like, experimenting and stuff. And, and when I was younger, I, 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 don't, I think I might have tried it, like, once, uh, you know, once every so often, but very recreationally. And, and I think it wasn't until 
I remember when I first started The Only Way is Essex, and, and by the way, I'm not putting any blame onto that whatsoever, but I'm just, I think, I think when I started TOWIE initially, and I'm sure the Love Islanders, they can relate, when you come off a huge show like that, you start getting booked up for like nightclub appearances. So I remember I was finding myself, I was in nightclubs up and down the country most nights of the week, like probably six nights a week. And I remember I was drinking, you know, near on all of those nights. And then I started doing drugs more and more. And um, I think my addiction started probably when, really badly, when my friends and family recognised it. I mean, my friends and family recognised that I was having a problem and I was, and I was, and it was more of a an addiction as opposed to me, you know, partying and stuff. That was probably, um, that was probably a year and a half into 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 Tawi, the only way is Essex. Well, did did this cost you relationships? I mean, then when you were in Tawi, um, you had a high profile relationship with Lydia Bright, for instance. Would would what you were yeah. going through would that have cost you relationships, for instance? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, when you know when I first got to Tawi, I kind of. The whole thing was kind of a shock to me. I'd only had one girlfriend my whole life. That was Lydia. I was, you know, I wasn't earning any money before Tally. I was going from job to job, trying to make it as a wedding singer. And then all of a sudden I started earning, you know, good money every week. Um, I had lots of attention from women in nightclubs and stuff. And, and that kind of all went to my head. And then when Lydia broke up with me, um, I suppose it was a bit of a, a bit of a shock. And, um, and then I struggled to deal with that. So, um, you know, the pain I was that I was going through from the heartbreak. Maybe I was, you know, I started using drugs heavily, um, more so to try and, you know, escape the feelings, the pain. And then I was also battling with the insecurities of how I looked on television. You know, um, I would kind of, I was just eating and eating to to cover the, you know, to kind of comfort myself and stuff. And you know, the, and then I thought, you know, if I get Lydia back, that would be the answer to all my problems. I got her back, and then I couldn't. You know, I was so deep into addiction, I, could, I couldn't stop. And then, so that relationship ended. I think you say, you know, heartbreak is you, to, yeah, it is I, a part of... But, but if you don't mind me asking then, how, how does that work out with your relationship with, with Gemma uh, now as well? Has it impaired on that? Yeah, for sure. Gemma's had to, Gemma's had to, you know, I really feel for Gemma because she's had to go through so much. She's... um. You know, she's, I used to kind of, when I was in deep into my addiction, I would hate Gemma because I would say, you know, why are you, uh, why are you telling my family? Why are you telling my friends? Why are you telling the bosses of the TV shows? You know, you're going to ruin my career. I don't want people knowing, but, but she refused to cover up for me. She wasn't an enabler. She was, she refused to lie for me. Um, uh, she, you know, she would never lie for me. She would never cover up. She never wanted to enable me to continue in my addiction. At the time, I hated her because I didn't want... I wanted to kind of almost get away with it and just be left alone to do what I wanted. But she, she, um, you know, she, um, she gave me some, some tough love, um, for sure. And she, could, she was hard on me. But, you know, thank God she was because, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, Gemma calling the ambulances and stuff um, to my house, you know, God knows what could have... W what could have happened and you know I, I, and at the moment I'm trying to the best way I can make amends by the best way I can make what I've you know I, at the end of the day I've put my my own life at risk my own health uh you know career and whatever but you know more importantly than that it, it's what I've put my family through it's what I've put my girlfriend through my friends my manager and and at the moment the only way that I can really make amends with these people and make it up to them is by staying clean and sober and it's yeah. it's all good you know making these promises uh, I'm going to do this, do that, but um, you know, action, actions speak louder than words. Yeah. Let's take you Ood, back, James, because you were mentioning there your support network, you know, your amazing family, Gemma. Um, you mentioned the ambulance there. Now I, we all remember seeing these stories in, in the newspapers that a, an ambulance was called to your house. You'd locked yourself inside. Your family were really worried, and as you said, it was Gemma who actually called the ambulance. Tell us what was going on inside with you while they were all outside banging on the door, worried to death about you. I think the first incident, I believe, happened around the end of October. I'd. Um, uh, I was the biggest I'd ever been. I was 23 and a half stone. Uh, I hated, you know, I just hated everything about myself. I was at an all time low. Um, and I remember around that period, uh, I, I remember I think I was, I was using drugs 
um, for like two or three days straight in my house. Um, I, I'd locked myself uh, into my house. The house was pitch black. Um, I bolted all the doors. Um, I turned my phone off, people, friends, family, trying to call me for two days. Uh, family, friends banging, smashing on the door, screaming for me to open up, I wouldn't. Um, and then Gemma felt the need um, to call the ambulance and the ambulance put the door through my house uh, alongside the police turned up and, and they did kind of tests um, and they sat with me and, and they sat with me for a good few hours and, um, you know, they decided that, they decided that, um, you know, that I could have been left, that I was okay to be kind of at home after the few hours they spent with me. And I said to myself, um, oh my God, police are outside, ambulance, paparazzi. Oh, like I was just absolutely freaking out. Like when I use, I get, um, like it's never rock and roll. It's never like glamorous, fun, uh, women, like rock and roll. It's always extremely lonely, um, isolated, me par having awful paranoia, psychosis. I'm shivering, shaking, blood coming down my nose. I'm sweating and it's um, it's just a, a horrific, horrific place to be in. But, but when you're that deep into addiction, I said to myself after that, I'll never ever use again. Two days later, I'm using again because it's just, it's just crazy. You know, something so... Yeah. Tell us about the low point. The, just, the, the ultimate low for you was was Christmas Day. Yeah, tell Day. us about Christmas Day because everybody talks, James, about you know hitting well, rock no. bottom, um, and you know you said you, you your family thought okay he's done that we were, was okay they left you you know with the company with your parents but then you used again and Christmas Day was just the most horrific day on sounds, your own on your own. Cr 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 Christmas Day was. Christmas, I mean, it, listen, I, up until Christmas Day, I was deep into addiction, but I completely lost hope and I completely just gave up. I was just, you know, over the last few years, I've had months where I'd get clean and sober, uh, I'd lose weight and I'd be like, yes, I've cracked it, I've done it. And, and you know, this is the start of my new life. And then I get complacent, stop exercising, putting on weight again. And then all of a sudden I'd be back kind of to square one. And it was Christmas Day. I remember Christmas Eve at home thinking, right, Gemma doesn't want to spend Christmas with me. She's with her family. My sister doesn't want to spend Christmas with me. She's with her boyfriend's family. My mum and dad have gone to Brighton to see my nan. But I thought, so if you know what, Christmas Eve, I'm going to I'm gonna prove people wrong. I'm going to stay clean, stay sober, and I'm going to travel up to Brighton and, and spend Christmas there. But that didn't happen. My addiction was so strong. Christmas Eve, I was using um, between the evening to the early hours. I was tossing and turning in bed. I woke up... Um, you know, there was no giving presents, there was no receiving presents, there was no Christmas songs playing on, on the radio. And, and uh, I remember going to my fridge and there was absolutely nothing in the fridge, nothing in the fridge, uh, nothing in the cupboards. And I remember going on um, like a delivery app and the only thing that I could order was a kebab. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that was to me, that was the all time, that was the all time low rock bottom. I spent Christmas day by myself indoors, feeling ill, horrific and and alone. And, and I've always, since I was a kid, I'd always valued Christmas. Like, I've, I love Christmas. Like, every every child does, an adult. I've always loved Christmas with myself, my family, girlfriends, celebrating, and, and it's a time for loved ones. And my addiction got so bad that, okay. my, you know, my, my Christmas led to me being dark and alone. OK, except you weren't alone. You had a guardian angel. There was a, a guardian angel in the form of Mark Wright. Tell us, tell us about Mark Wright yeah. and the role that he has played in your life. Uh, well, Mark's, Mark's my, my best friend. Um, Mark, alongside of his cousin Elliot, they're, you know, they're two of my, my closest friends. And, um, and, you know, Mark, you know, me and... <laughs> yeah, he's, he's always been there for me. Um, from my ups and downs. And Mark, like, like alongside Gemma, Mark's always kind of given me tough love. Um, and throughout the whole of December, he was making phone calls to me, um, you know, begging me to go into rehab and get treatment. And I just, I wasn't ready. I just, I didn't want to go. I just given up hope. I didn't want to stop, uh, you know. And, and it wasn't until Boxing Day, I kind of rung up Mark um, and I said, you know, Mark, you know, I just, I don't, I can't do this anymore. Like, you know, every time you relapse, the relapses get worse and worse. Um, and 
over December it was the first time where I thought, wow, like I'm actually close to death. Um, so I just, I just, you know, I knew that if I don't get my, sort myself out, I could have, you know, I could potentially have died. And I rang up Mark and Mark went out of his way. He got in contact with uh, a rehab in Thailand. He spoke to the owners. He, he helped, um, he helped organize it all in, in terms of like the financial side of things. He helped me book my flights. He arranged, you know, uh, he arranged everything. And, you know, I'm forever grateful for Mark for that. You know, his cousin Elliot's also been there for me and Elliot offered to pay for me to go to a rehab in Marbella and whatever. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to have, I'm lucky to have friends like that. Um, he, he and sorted, I love Mark. I yeah. love Elliot. I love Elliot. They bits. obviously, they obviously love you, James. And as you said, Mark sorted that out. You did ten weeks in rehab in Thailand. Um, you lost five stone while you were there. So, let's talk about the positives mm. now. Moving forward, you're home. You've done the rehab. Yeah. How positive yeah. are you now that you won't relapse again? That this is, you know, you can move forward in a positive way. At the moment, I'm in early stages of of recovery. Yeah, I've I've lost I've lost you know a substantial amount of weight, which is great. I mean, a big a big part of my using, like I said before, was the eating eating disorder. So I'm eating three balanced meals a day. Um, I'm regularly exercising every day. Um, I went from 23 and a half stone to 18 and a half stone. So that's a positive start. But in terms of recovery, um, I've come back. I'm I'm attending an outpatients at the moment. So between the hours of 9.45 a.m. to 12.45 a.m., I'm doing, obviously at the moment, I can't go there. Um, so we're doing meetings online, Zoom meetings. Um, I'm also regularly in phone calls with other addicts and people that, you know, can relate with me, um, people that have gone through the same things that I've gone through. So, um, and I'm just trying to keep myself as busy as I can, give myself struct structure and routine. It's very difficult uh, in lockdown and, and I, I do pray for other suffering addicts out there because when you're in treatment, the first thing they say to you is, when you go home, don't isolate. Don't, <laughs> don't isolate, you know, surround, you know, keep yourself, you know, keep yourself, keep being social, see people, don't isolate. And as soon as the, the day after I got home, uh, old Boris announced on the telly that <laughs> you're not allowed to see anyone and, and you've got to isolate. So it is difficult times, uh, it's difficult, um, uh, being in lockdown and recovery, and I'm sure there's there's a lot of addicts out there suffering, but I'm lucky that I've got the support system. I've got, you know, I've got amazing friends, not, not only Mark and Elliot and Gemma and my family. I've got Joey Essex, who's FaceTimes me every day without fail. Um, uh, Fern McCann, and I've just got amazing, amazing close friends. My bandmates, they often send me songs to, you know, lift up my spirits. And, um, you know, moving forward, um, at the moment, I just want to focus on my recovery and my health. Um, you know, after lockdown in due course, I would love to, you know, really kickstart the Arge Band and get that going again because that's something that I'm proud of and passionate about. And, you know, when the, you know, I know there was a story recently saying that I'd quit reality TV. There are certain shows that might not be good for me and I might have to avoid, but there might be other things that I could potentially do that, you know, that could be positive and could be. You know, if they're achieving goals or something, then then why not? I just what about, hope. What that about celebrity SAS this can really like, be like the Joey? Kickstart to my new life. What about celebrity SAS like Joey? <laughs> Do you know what? I watched Joey. I watched. I, I, I watched uh, Celebrity SAS and honestly, I I, 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 shed, I nearly shed a tear yeah. watching Joey on it. He was absolutely amazing. He'd done everyone proud. And I do feel that, um, you know, whenever it is they start filming again, if I'm in the right physical space and headspace, that could be a, an amazing show for me. You know, yeah. shows like that. I'm a big fan of Dancing on Ice and, and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, you never know. Something that can, you, you, something that could, something that could, you know, keep me fit, keep me active, something that's... Um, yeah. Something yeah. that you can achieve, not just me well, sitting you've in the house having rows with people and stuff like that. That's not for me. <laughs> you no. have achieved so much, yeah. my friend. <laughs> keep on that road. Keep getting well. Keep getting fit. Keep being good. Uh, our, our love and uh, our good wishes to you and to Gemma. And thank you for taking the time speaking to us this morning. No, thank you so much. Honestly, love you both. And uh, all, the all the years I've been on this show, this today, for some reason, it felt different. I was so nervous, but I just feel so relieved now. And um, onwards and upwards. Yeah, well, you, you help a lot of people as well by talking about it, James. Take care, darling, OK? Bye-bye. Oh, See, See you. Wow. Mm.